Are we all here now? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Rabia. Welcome back, everybody. Um, well, I said welcome back. Welcome to those who've only been able to join us now, and welcome back to those who've already been with us in the very interesting uh, morning session. My name is Christopher Bisping. Um, I join you from Butzerius Law School in Hamburg, in Germany, although I'm physically located in the University of Warwick at the moment, so closer to home than you think. Um, we, we've got a very high profile um, speaker panel now. It reminded me a little bit of Four Weddings and a Funeral, in that we have the academic practitioner, so uh, almost uh, <laughs> a very lame joke to start with, but um, hoping to break the ice. Um, just by way of housekeeping, normally I would probably tell you when the alarm goes off, leave the room. We haven't got any uh, any um, any uh, test plant. Uh, I don't have to do that. The housekeeping today is please keep yourself muted unless you wish to uh, unless you wish to talk. Uh, in which case, don't forget to unmute yourself. Ideally, put in the chat if you would like to ask a question. Uh, Anyway, you can um, put questions in the chat throughout the presentations, and I'll keep an eye on that. Um, but don't just um, uh, bark in from, because uh, then nobody knows where the sound comes from. Um, our speakers have been instructed to, to stick to roughly 15 uh, minutes, and then there will be time for all questions um, at the end of, of this session. And before we set off, let me introduce the speakers to you very briefly. Our first speaker is Peter Cartwright, who doesn't really need much by way of introduction. He's a professor of consumer protection in, in Nottingham. Uh, before that, he was at Abriswith, and he's a prolific writer, has written several books on the topic uh, consumer protection and the criminal law, banks and consumer, uh, bank consumers and regulation, uh, to name but a few. And together with Richard Hyde, he submitted an impact study to the latest REF. Um, and they are currently also looking at the relationship between consumer vulnerability and technology. And that's also where his talk today comes in, uh, which is titled Virtual Coercion and Video Gaming, Protecting Vulnerable Consumers in Immersive Technologies. Our second speaker is Nick Ryder from UWE Bristol, um, an equally prolific writer and also an advisor to a lot of bodies internationally um, and, and also closer uh, to home. He's attracted a lot of research funding in his time from various uh, uh, sources and will today talk to us about the regulation of consumer credit market um, creditors and vulnerability, question mark, time for the criminal law to step up. Third speaker, Dimitrios uh, Kagiaros from the University of Durham, assistant professor there in public law and human rights. Um, and his main research is focused on the European Convention system of human rights protection. Uh, and he's looked in particular at the impact of the European sovereign debt crisis on human rights and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights in relation to freedom of expression. And today he'll be speaking on the socioeconomic dimension of vulnerability analysis in the European Court of Human Rights. And then after the three academics, one practitioner, Robin Feiner, who works for the Financial Conduct Authority, and he doesn't only work there, uh, he is the head of competition economics uh, at the FCA, um, and he has led the uh, general insurance uh, pricing practices market study recently um, within the FCA. And before that, he was head of wholesale and investments competition and led a number of the market uh, sector studies carried out by the FCA. Prior to that, he was a director of economic analysis at the Competition Commission, therefore very well um, suited to talk to us today about consumer vulnerability and financial regulation. But that's enough from me. I make it now 11.40, which gives Peter time till 11.55 for his talk. Peter, over to you. So thank you very much indeed, Christopher, for the, the kind introduction. And thanks, of course, for the uh, invitation to speak to you today. So I am going to talk to you about a part of a broader research project I'm doing, as Christopher said, with uh, Richard Hyde, my colleague at Nottingham, which is under the broad area of what we call exploitative technologies. Um, this particular part is looking at a specific uh, 
a product or practice facility, I'm not quite sure what the right word is, I'm going to call it an item, within uh, video games called the loot box. Now I'm going to have a go at sharing my screen now, which I hope will um, allow you to see my slides. And oop, if we go back a bit, um, I'll start off by asking the question, well, what exactly do we mean by the, the loot box? Well, loot boxes were described by the writers Close and Lloyd as purchasable video game content with randomized rewards. An example of a loot box is found in the well-known FIFA football video game. What it does is it offers the, the gamer, who's the, the consumer for our purposes, the chance to win high value players who will help them in the game. Um, the point about loot boxes is that they're randomized. Clearly when someone's playing a video game, they will often get the opportunity to purchase something which will help them in the game. So a, you know, a magic sword or a ladder or something that helps them to progress to the next level. What's different about loot boxes is there's no guarantee what the consumer is getting. They're, they're winning the opportunity to get something that's going to assist them. Um, so most commonly loot boxes are something that will help someone either to win or to progress in the particular game that they're, they're playing. They're not the only sort. There's also um, a form of loot box called the skin, which is really a sort of a cosmetic item that allows the gamer to change a character's appearance. They raise the slightly different consumer protection um, issues that I'm not going to focus on them in this in this paper. I talked about loot boxes as being um, randomized or involving randomized rewards. So one possible question to ask is, well, are they not just gambling? Should we not regulate them through, through gambling? You're paying for the chance to win something of, of value. And in some countries, for example, Belgium, that's exactly how they are classified. Now in the United Kingdom, the Gambling Commission argues that because loot boxes are typically confined for use within a game and they can't be cashed out, they don't constitute gambling for the purposes of the Gambling Act. Now that may change, it's something on which the government is currently um, consulting, but it's our contention that unless and until it does, loot boxes can and should be regulated through consumer protection law. And in the United Kingdom, that means through a piece of legislation called the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations, which implement the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive in the, the UK. Now, there's very little um, consumer law scholarship on loot boxes. And what there is focuses very much on information being the remedy. So a number of uh, writers have argued that the harm that they involve, which I'll talk about in a moment, can be tackled by simply disclosing the odds of winning particular prizes. And that is the approach that's taken in some countries, for example, by, by China. For the purposes of European law, that would mean treating the odds of winning as being material information, which um, must be disclosed at an appropriate point to the, the consumer. Now, it's our contention that disclosure is not the most appropriate tool to use to protect consumers. And the principal reason for that is the cognitive biases that we know exist. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about those later, but just to kind of introduce the sorts of things we're talking about now. A number of biases have been identified, things like the gambler's fallacy, the near miss effect, the sunk cost fallacy, the existence of over information, which all suggests that providing information, particularly in this kind of context, is unlikely to allow consumers to make informed choices. So we would argue that it's actually better and more appropriate to deal with loot boxes through provisions on aggressive commercial practices and the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive uh, deals with those as well as misleading practices. So what is an aggressive practice? Well, I've taken the definition from Regulation 7.1 of the UK's Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations. 
And that says that a commercial practice is aggressive if, in its factual context, taking account of all its features and circumstances, it significantly impairs or is likely significantly to impair the average consumer's freedom of choice or conduct in relation to the product concerned through the use of harassment, coercion of undue influence, and it thereby causes or is likely to cause him to take a transactional decision he would not have taken otherwise. So that's the essence of the aggressive commercial practice. In the, the article that will emerge from this, this paper, we go into quite a lot more detail on the substantive law and why we think that applies appropriately to, to loot boxes. What I thought it would be useful just to, to introduce now is, in a sense, the essence of the harm that we think is involved in their provision, how that, that comes about. And this involved engaging quite a bit with the literature and other disciplines, particularly in computer science. So this is not you know, our original sort of typologies or taxonomies. We've, we've drawn them from, um, from other commentators. But if we look, for example, at the work of, of, of King, we see that the ways in which games are designed in order to immerse gamers, so consumers, in them. So King identifies how a combination of um, aesthetic, story, uh, character, and gameplay features combine, kind of aggregate, to immerse the gamer in the, um, in, in the game in, in question. There's also literature on different kind of forms of immersion. So Nielsen talks about narrative immersion, challenge-based immersion, systems immersion. And we also found typologies that distinguish between the kind of degrees of involvement that consumers may have at different points in the game. So that moving from um, engagement to engrossment and then ultimately to what Brown and Kearns talk of as ultimate, or sorry, to total um, immersion. Now, it's our argument that um, if you look at how games are designed to immerse gamers in, uh, in a way that um, we would argue could be um, coercive, might even involve some degree of undue influence, that um, directs us towards using aggressive commercial practices provisions as the most appropriate tool. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are different forms of loot boxes that may be involved different sorts of harm. What I'm going to talk about mainly here are what we might describe as pay to win or pay to skip loot boxes. These are the most common ones that are found in video games. And what you're doing here really is you're buying either a better opportunity to win at the game. So the FIFA product will be an example of that. You buy a loot box, you hope that you end up with Mohamed Salah or Virgil van Dijk, but the probability is that you're going to end up with perhaps a player of rather uh, less, less value. Um, the alternative is loot boxes that help you not so much to win, but actually to progress. So to get to the next stage, of uh, the game. I can't claim any expertise here, I'm afraid, but I'm reliably informed that Star Wars Battleship, sorry, beg your pardon, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is an example of a game that utilized that sort of, of loot box. Now, one point to remember is that the game, the features in the games are offered at a time when the player is most susceptible to making a a purchase. One of the things that the regulations reveal is that timing is always a factor that should be considered when assessing whether or not a product or a practice is uh, aggressive. So finding and identifying the time when the individual is going to be most vulnerable or susceptible uh, to making a choice is obviously going to be something that we need to, to take into, into account. There's also an added factor, an added element where cooperative games are an issue. When someone's, for example, playing as part of a team, maybe with somebody that they that they know or even somebody that they that they don't. In those circumstances, there's the added pressure of not wanting to let the team down. And it's really in this context primarily that I want to think about this question of consumer vulnerability and of the, the benchmarks that we apply when trying to identify whether or not a practice um, is 
um, aggressive. So the contention really that loot boxes can be or might be aggressive commercial practices is strengthened when we look at the benchmarks against which commercial practices are assessed. So what the law does is it starts with the assumption that you know, the benchmark we apply is that of the average consumer who is reasonably well informed, reasonably observant and circumspect. But that benchmark can be varied in two respects. First of all, where the practice is aimed at a particular group of consumers, it's assessed by the benchmark of the average member of that group. And we talk about that as the kind of the average targeted standard. And then second, where there's a clearly identifiable group of consumers who are particularly vulnerable to the practice or the product because of specific factors, and they're identified in the legislation as mental or physical infirmity, age or credulity, and the trader should have foreseen that vulnerability, then that provides the benchmark. The average member of that group provides the benchmark. So what I would talk about, and just I realize I'm not got a lot of time left, but what I would talk about really in the final part is how we might look at those sort of elements of vulnerability that are identified in the legislation and say, well, what do they tell us about this particular product and this particular practice? Um, if we start looking about at, at age and think about loot boxes and younger consumers, well, some games are quite clearly targeted at consumers of a particular age, and some are demonstrably not targeted at consumers of a particular age. But research by the Pan-European Game Information, PEGI, which is the, the video game content rating system, estimates that about 83% of young people play video games when they are below the age on the certification. And that raises obvious um, issues. If we think about, for example, about adolescence, obviously the trouble about when we talk about younger consumers is that you know, there's a wide range of people. But if we think about adolescence as an example, they may be particularly susceptible or vulnerable to low esteem, to peer pressure, things that are you know, particular issues in cooperative games. And it's quite clear that lots of these consumers purchase loot boxes. So there was a 2018 study by the Gambling Commission that found that 31% of 11 to 16 year olds had used loot boxes that they found in, in games. So age is clearly a factor that we have to, to think about. If we move then to mental or physical um, infirmity, although games could be targeted at those with infirmity, it's probably the vulnerable consumer standard that's more likely to be relevant and to apply here. One, of these, one thing we can look at here is the fact that gaming disorder is now internationally recognized as being a disease. And it, 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 I would argue it's surely foreseeable that loot boxes might be aimed at and, and used by and coercive for those who have gaming um, disorder, not least because that, um, that condition significantly impacts self-control. It's very, very close to the harms that are associated with, with gambling and actually looking at the evidence from gambling helps us a lot in understanding the harm from loot boxes. And then my final point is the issue of credulity. It's always difficult to identify a clearly identifiable group of consumers who are particularly vulnerable to something other but not in relation to their age or their infirmity. But one thing we could do is we could say that where um, problem gaming fall short of a recognised um, infirmity, it, it may be relevant to credulity. And we can draw on that behavioural science that I talked about earlier, about the kinds of cognitive biases that, that you know, all consumers are susceptible to, but some consumers may be particularly susceptible to, um, and think what, whether that helps us to inform, helps to inform us on the standard we should be um, applying. It's also worth noting as a, a, a final point that um, there is a lot of research on the sorts of consumers who engage with loot boxes and that shows that uh, it, they are particularly linked with gamers who are male, who are young and who are of lower educational achievement. And given that that is known, that is obviously foreseen or foreseeable by 
by traders. And I think that, 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 that should help us to, to frame how the practice is assessed. Right, I think I'm a couple of seconds over my 15 minutes, so my uh, apologies for that. But thank you very much indeed for, for listening. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have later on. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that was very interesting. I've got a son who falls into the gamer category, I think. So uh, I found that personally interesting too. Um, Good night, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> you were spot on with time. Um, Nick, over to you then, please. That's great. Thank you. Is it wrong to admit that my middle age, I'm actually an active gamer as well? Perhaps I'm showing my immaturity. Uh, Battlefront 2 is one of my personal favourites, but I'll leave that for another time, Pete, when we, we can catch up and discuss it properly. Uh, right, let me just share the screen. Hopefully this will work. Right, bear with me a moment. My laptop does not like Zoom. There we are. Can you all see that okay? That's great. Thank you. So again, as, as Peter said, I think very <clears throat> a warm welcome um, and thank you for inviting me to give to give a talk. Um, this this is a joint presentation uh, with a colleague of mine, Jan, Dan Dzinski, who was unable to make it today because of uh, uh, university started this week. So it's all hands to the deck, I'm afraid, in terms of delivering classes. Um, I, I think I'm quite a rare commodity because it's unusual. Uh, my doctorate was on consumer credit law, as, as Peter will know, and I've sort of morphed away from that into more of the financial crime uh, arena the last uh, the last 10 11 years so um i think an, an opportunity to talk about my my initial uh, enjoyment of consumer credit and linking it into financial crime is 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 quite an interesting um proposition so in the, uh, this um 15 minute presentation what i'm going to try and do is to revisit um some of the initial um aspects about the availability of credit and how that market has just exploded in the past uh, 20 years has been very well documented and I'm not going to run through all the literature on, on that with you. Um, I'm then going to move on to affordable credit, but the primary focus of, of the presentation is maybe to look at the United States of America and to have, perhaps look at maybe more of a controversial um, policy where they, they appear to criminalize um, what we tend to call predatory lending and whether that concept actually amounts to, to fraud under the Fraud Act. Um, I haven't quite got my head on some of that yet, but this is very much a work in progress um, presentation and I'd, I'd welcome your, your views on that. Um, if we look at modern credit, I mean, the Crowther Committee, everyone's around 1971 and how that's sort of, you know, I suppose the initial view of, of from P Professor Roy Good is that, you know, credit's there to purchase motor cars and holidays and, and, and home improvements and, and, and other things. But obviously, what what we have found is the significant growth in in access to credit. Um, I think nineteen seventy one there was one credit card. I think it was American Express or Barclay card. I forget. You've now got over thirteen hundred, and the ease at which people can gain access to credit is still uh, was part of my fourth chapter for my PhD, and is still relevant in twenty twenty one, which again is quite scary. Um, so I think it's that evolution, and and partly fueled by deregulation. Um, I think different governments of political uh, colours, uh, red, black, or blue, um, all have different interpretations of what meant of meant to convenient credit. Of course, credit spending fuels the economy. The economy grows. People tend to be uh, more affluent in terms of their, their aspirations. But of course, there, there's always a dark side. Uh, yesterday, my star was linking again. There's always a dark side to that type of, of consumer credit. So what, what we have found is that in terms of access to consumer credit, everything's changed. You now, where can we start? You can access credit via your mobile phone, your interactive television set, you can apply online. Uh, and I think what was intriguing teaching consumer credit law a number of years ago is just the ease at which you can have your credit rating simply extended without your consent. Uh, I remember going on holiday about a decade ago to, and wanting to buy some trainers in, in, a, in a, a sports shop in Vancouver. And the credit card was declined. So, of course, you read the credit provider to find out what the reasons behind that is. And says, oh, sorry, but we sent you a new credit card. We simply doubled your, your credit from £4,000 to £8,000. Didn't ask for it, didn't consent to it. So, does that partly fuel a movement maybe away from a, a, a good envisaged, the, the sort of affordable credit, perhaps to more convenient credit? And, and I think that's part of a problem that we do live in, in in a society where financial institutions and creditors are very keen to exploit vulnerable consumers. 
Um, we then got the very well documented research on financial exclusion. Um, again, the figures will, will, will vary. Uh, some reports in the 1990s by Pratt et al. estimated that it was as high as 24%. Um, more recent figures have suggested between seven to 10 million people in the UK are financially excluded. But again, the definition is quite difficult. Um, I remember reading literature um, a number of years ago now by the Dutch of Trust and other academics who claimed that financial exclusion was simply based on how far away from your local bank was. Well, my bank is in the next village in Cardiff and that's four or five miles away. Therefore, I am financially excluded doesn't really make any sense because I can drive to the village and get the bus that if I need to. So there are some issues there. Um, with the uh, the uh, general election victory for Labour in 1997 under Tony Blair, we had the promotion of financial inclusion and policy action team 14 in particular investigated access to financial services. So you can see it in terms of that sort of how the credit market has exploded and has promoted financial inclusion and obviously financial exclusion. Um, got some academic studies there for you, you're probably familiar with them, you've got some great work by Anna Aurora, the FC obviously have looked at financial inclusion, um, you then got the statutory objective and the section 1c of the Financial Services Act, consumer protection, competition objective, all based of course on the old section 4 of FISMA 2000 about promoting consumer awareness. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, there are some basic definitions of financial exclusion, um, and again there is no real academic consensus, but I suppose the crux of the presentation looks at the 2007-8 financial crisis and, and a little bit of reflection in terms of what actually caused it. Um, financial regulators, there's an argument. Uh, governments, possibility in terms of weak economic policy. Weak banking regulation, I would suggest yes, the evidence supports that. Banking culture, yes. Financial institutions, maybe consumers uh, due to excessive use of credit. Uh, I won't quote Gordon Gecko from Wall Street too, uh, but he did use the term ninja loans, no income, no asset and no jobs. And that's what American credit does tend to offer people. But you then got at the back of my mind seven eight years ago, well, what about financial crime? So if you look at the crisis in particular, one of the major reasons in America was mortgage, but also the concept of what we call predatory lending. And this sort of second part of, of the, the presentation looks at, well, how have the US courts adapted to predatory lending where the lender provides a loan to somebody who simply has got no, no choice or no um, or to repay it because the monthly repayments are so high? So if we look at the history lesson, Wall Street crash, partly caused by the, fina the financial crime. If you read the Pecora Commission, the 440 page report on the Wall Street crash, Lots of accusations and convictions for fraud, money laundering, market manipulation, and so on. The savings and loans crisis, the 1980s, partly caused by control and auditing fraud. Uh, we've seen the collapse of large firms in the US and, of course, within the UK, Polypec and Barron's Bank are two of those more um, relevant examples. But what about the 2007-8 financial crisis? Well, it's fair to say that the subprime mortgage market is linked into mortgage fraud. Uh, the FBI reported in 2014 that the extent of mortgage fraud was $14.1 billion a year in the US. We've seen over 1,000 convictions in America since 2008 for mortgage fraud, a significant increase. We've seen a massive spike in the number of suspicious activity reports filed by US financial institutions to the American Financial Intelligence Unit, FinCEN, of allegations of mortgage fraud. We've seen fraud committed by credit rating agencies, for example, Standard & Poor was subjected to a deferred prosecution agreement by the Department of Justice and paid a $5 billion fine for predatory lending and inflated rating. Uh, predatory lending, the highest fine imposed to date in America is against Bank of America by the Department of Justice in 2017, where the bank was fined, wait for it, $16.65 billion. Uh, that fine dwarfs every fine imposed by the US, UK city regulator since 2000. £16.65 billion pounds for predatory lending. Uh, Ponzi fraud schemes, Mr. Madoff, Alan, uh, Alan Johnson, very well documented examples. And then, of course, we've got market manipulation, uh, the LIBOR crisis, the Forex crisis. There is a lot of evidence of that conduct occurring pre, during and post financial crisis. So how do we define predatory lending? Well, according to the US Department of Justice, it's deceptive behavior by the lender and unfair tactic, tactics used to dupe people 
into mortgage loans they simply can't afford. So there's your deception. There's your intent. Um, it, it's, it's a very aggressive term adopted by the US uh, Department of Justice. The Treasury Department have a similar definition. So this is where the individual, the lender, will be involved in deception, fraud, manipulation, that phrase crops up again, through aggressive sales tactics or taking unfair advantage of the possibly vulnerable borrower's lack of understanding about the terms of the actual agreement. So you note already a significant difference in the terminology used across the pond, maybe compared to the UK. I know the, the FSA used to use the former definition of, I think it was irresponsible lending and irresponsible borrowing, but clearly in the US you've got that aggressive predatory lending. So in relation to court decisions on this particular matter, in American Financial Services Association and Toledo in 2005, the accepted definition is the use of fraud, deception, manipulation, or the borrower through aggressive sales tactics or taking unfair advantage of the borrower's lack of understanding. So again, you can see that within the American legal framework, there is an element in terms of deception, deceit, and an element of fraud where the, the, the vulnerable consumer could possibly be targeted unfairly by uh, the credit provider. Just look at the legal framework. I'm not going to bore you all these now. I've only got um, about four and a half minutes left. I, I'm conscious that I don't want to go over my uh, my 15 minutes. Um, all of these legislations seek to tackle and offer consumer protection in the United States of America. Um, so you've got the Federal Trade Commission Act, 1914. They play a very important role. The Truth and Lending Act. These laws are far from perfect. And in some occasions, they've actually contributed to predatory lending and have actually contributed to um, a concept called redlining. Um, this is where US lenders will refuse to offer loans to individuals based upon the socioeconomic um, buildup within a particular area. Some people actually call it racial profiling, where the US banks will not lend. So to address that problem, the American legislature implemented the 1977 Community Reinvestment Act, where US lenders are compelled to maintain a branch network. Now, there's no chance of that law ever be coming into the UK. Um, it's been discussed at a few select committee inquiries, but beyond that, I don't think there's any political desire to really include that sort of maintaining that branch network within the UK. So these are some of the fines imposed um, by a variety of US law enforcement agencies on lenders purely for predatory lending. Uh, U.S. Bank, Household International, Country World Finances, the Bank of America, 16.65 billion. Wells Fargo, multiple occasions. Deutsche Bank crops up again in addition to its fines for money laundering. And of course, Credit Suisse. So you've got a long track history here of U.S. lenders admitting to financial penalties and on some occasions entering into deferred prosecution agreements with the Department of Justice or with other US law enforcement agencies. Part of the difficulty with the deferred prosecution agreement is that it's merely a contract. This is where the lender will admit, yep, yeah, we messed up here. They'll agree to a five-year contract. They will uh, pay a massive fine. They'll pay some compensation to consumers. They will change their corporate governance structures and they will carry on operating as normal. The best example I can give you of a DPA not being effective is HSBC with the Department of Justice in 2012. If you're not familiar with the facts, the uh, multinational financial institution was accused and convicted by the Department of Justice of facilitating money laundering to Russian mafia in Mexico to laundering money for the South American drug cartels and perhaps more importantly, breaching the UN sanctions regime for terrorism financing for suspicious banks in Saudi Arabia who of course have links to Al-Qaeda. No one from the bank was ever prosecuted and the CEO offered a profound apology. So the fines make a nice headline figure and they are significantly higher than the fines imposed in the UK for similar uh, examples, but you have to question where the DPAs are the most appropriate forum. But I think that's another whole debate, I think in itself anyway. So what conclusions have we got from this work in progress? Um, my research has suggested that predatory lending contributes to the financial crisis. Um, there's a lot of literature um, about four or five years ago that links the financial crisis to financial crime. Um, the obvious examples would be mortgage fraud, and that's the FBI figures of, of uh, $14.1 billion. Um, the 
UK consumer credit has grown at an unprecedented rate. The ease of access to convenient credit is now extending clearly on a daily by daily basis. But it's important to remember that the tax, the sorry, the credit system is very complex and it can be quite difficult for urban consumers to understand. Consumers need money. We've seen the £20 cap of the British government this week. So what we're going to see is that more and more people will get into over indebtedness. And I always remember one line to finish off with. When I started teaching consumer credit laws and reading Peter's work many years ago, I always remember reading some, some statistics that for every four minutes I gave a lecture, UK levels of debt would increase by £900,000. So if those figures are still active in 2021, I've been talking now for 15 minutes, that means somewhere between 10 and 15 million pounds has been added to consumer levels of debt. And I think that was not bad, 14 minutes and 25 seconds. Hope that was okay, everybody. Happy to take questions after. Thank you very much, Nick. You've left us on a very sobering note with the rising debt levels. Um, that was very interesting, uh, especially looking at this intersection between criminal and consumer credit law. We are uh, changing tack slightly now, and Demetrius is going to take a slightly more public law perspective, probably. Over to you, Demetrius. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so, of course, I have to begin by uh, thanking Dr. Dodsworth and Professor Reefer for uh, organizing this event. It's, it's honestly quite rare that we get to discuss these issues um, across different disciplines. And, and God, already just by listening to uh, the previous presentations, I realized how limited my understanding of vulnerability has been so far, and I consider myself an expert. Um, so, uh, uh, I will very much be focusing on an entirely different area of law, human rights law, and more specifically, uh, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, um, the court has increasingly focused on a rights holder's vulnerability in a vast array of judgments in its reasoning. And uh, this reference to vulnerability is not merely a rhetorical flourish. So it is actually used uh, in the court in a way that is legally meaningful in that it produces legal effects that may end up having a huge influence on the outcome of the specific case. Now, the function of vulnerability in the reasoning of the European Court of Human Rights is actually quite complex, and I most certainly don't have time to cover it all. So instead, I will be focusing on one dimension, uh, and that is the use of vulnerability as a justification for the court to find that the respondent state has a duty under the European Convention on Human Rights to provide the applicant with material support. So usually uh, in the form of shelter or other types of welfare. And I will examine what exactly it is that vulnerability analysis can contribute to the court's reasoning in such cases. And also highlighting some, and I will also be highlighting some potential pitfalls of the concept especially when it comes to the way in which the court has deployed it in its reasoning. Um, so just to give some background to the court's use of vulnerability uh, in its case law, um, this is something that's particularly well researched. Uh, so scholars like Peroni and Timmer have uh, conducted very far reaching uh, research into the use of vulnerability in the European Court of Human Rights and other scholars have um, adopted a much more critical approach of how the court employs the concept. Uh, but just to give some main points, sort of a whistle-stop tour of vulnerability in the court's case law. Now, first of all, the European Court of Human Rights has not provided a definition of vulnerability and has mostly assigned vulnerable status to an individual on the basis of their membership to a specific social group. So the court does not so much rely on individual vulnerability, uh, but instead uh, um, uh, focuses on group vulnerability. Now, the rationale of assigning vulnerable status to a specific social group also differs. And as many scholars have pointed out, the, the approach the court uses is perhaps quite incoherent. So for example, uh, the court has assigned vulnerable status to members of the Roma community uh, on the basis um, that they have faced discrimination uh, traditionally across Europe. The court has also assigned vulnerable status to individuals living with HIV. And the reason for that is that according to the court, they're vulnerable because 
um, individuals living with HIV have faced a long history of prejudice and stigmatization. Uh, the court has also assigned vulnerable status to asylum seekers. Uh, and for this um, a category of persons, the court has relied on the fact that they're fleeing their country and embarking on quite a perilous journey uh, to reach uh, a safe harbor. Now, of course, this understanding of vulnerability that is based on membership to a specific group rather than one's own individual circumstances would very much go against um, approaches to vulnerability like the one by Professor Feynman, who views vulnerability as something that is universal and constant that in a way we're all exposed to rather than a, than, than a characteristic that is solely related to certain um, marginalized groups. Um, but before uh, looking at the specific socioeconomic dimension of vulnerability, some context on the European Court of Human Rights is necessary. So the European Court of Human Rights oversees the implementation of the European Convention on Human Rights across 47 states, including the United Kingdom. And the convention as an instrument of human rights law is aimed particularly towards protecting what we would call civil and political rights. And these are rights that set limits to government's power to interfere with individual freedoms. The convention includes very few rights that would fall under the category of what we call socioeconomic rights. So for instance, the right to housing or the right to food or the right to an adequate standard of living are not included in the specific human rights instrument. But the European Court of Human Rights has realized that rights are interrelated and interconnected. So applicants to the court have relied on the civil and political rights protected in the convention to make some limited socioeconomic claims. So for instance, the court has found that the right to a fair trial, a traditional civil and political right, may require the state to provide some financial material assistance to litigants, or for instance, the right to life, another classic civil and political right, uh, may require the state to adopt certain uh, measures of healthcare provision, even though the right to health itself is not protected in the convention. But still, the court has demonstrated a great degree of deference where its decision could have serious budgetary implications for the state or create a duty on the state to adopt a specific social policy. And the court has reiterated that the convention in no way guarantees a minimum standard of living or a shelter. Now, where does vulnerability come in uh, in this discussion? Now, the court has uh, found in some occasions that individuals belonging to a vulnerable group can rely on the civil and political rights protected in the convention to require the state to provide them with certain material support. So members of vulnerable groups have an added claim to make in the uh, in, uh, through the convention one that is not available to individuals that the court perceives as not being vulnerable. However, vulnerability on its own does not suffice to unlock a state duty to provide material support to an applicant. This applicant that's requesting the support must also be in a situation where they are wholly reliant on state support for their survival uh, and their exposed to a situation uh, which is, as the court says, incompatible with human dignity. So an example of that would be uh, prisoners, uh, children who are uh, uh, staying in a state institution, asylum seekers. So all these individuals have been deemed by the court to be uh, members of vulnerable groups. And they're also in a position where they are wholly reliant on state support for their survival. Now, to illustrate this by way of an example, looking to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, a very well-known case uh, is called MSS uh, against Belgium and Greece. And it's a case that relates to an uh, asylum seeker who reached the shores of Greece from Afghanistan, lodged an asylum uh, application, and then was left completely destitute to roam the streets of Athens without any support throughout the many months his asylum request was being assessed by the relevant authorities. 
And this uh, exposure to deprivation, where the Greek state did absolutely nothing to support this individual during this time, uh, was um, the rationale the court relied on to suggest that this individual had faced a violation of his rights to Article 3 of the Convention, which protects um, against torture, inhuman, and degrading treatment. And this was because he belonged to a vulnerable group, asylum seekers, and also because he was in a position where he could not look after himself. He could not lawfully work in Greece at the time uh, to support himself. And as such, the state had a duty to provide him with material support. So in this context, vulnerability seems to be the sort of key that unlocks state obligations to provide material support that would otherwise be unavailable uh, to all these applicants. Uh, so it seems to be a very interesting um, uh, tool that the court can rely on to strengthen its socioeconomic jurisprudence. But on the other hand, we have to perhaps see how the court's use of vulnerability uh, is, is highly problematic. The uh, applicant in the case I described was considered to be vulnerable because of their status as an asylum seeker and not because they were homeless. Uh, the court hasn't, assigned, uh, hasn't assigned vulnerable status to individuals who are uh, facing and exposed to hom homelessness. So if we imagine that um, uh, this individual in the streets of Athens uh, was accompanied by another homeless person who was exposed to the exact same um, uh, experience of deprivation but did not belong to a vulnerable group, then these two individuals have two entirely different claims that they can make before the European uh, Court on, uh, of Human Rights. So, uh, from the court's perspective, some of the individuals, like the ones we saw in the video from the first panel, and those of you who were there looked at this, this you know, horrific case of someone being exposed to quite extreme, um, uh, extreme poverty, such individuals would not be considered vulnerable, at least in the way in which the European Court of Human Rights uses that term. And so here we see that the court engages in a sort of distinction between uh, those who are poor and blameless because they belong to a vulnerable group, whereas people who do not belong to such a group uh, should try and pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, so to an extent, we can see that vulnerability perhaps works in an exclusionary way in this context. On the one hand, it helps people who are part of vulnerable groups to make much stronger claims before the European Court of Human Rights, but at the same time, it caused these extra provisions are only meant for vulnerable people, everyone else is excluded from them. So one could say, well, perhaps the answer to this problem is that the court should expand who it considers to be vulnerable, perhaps in line with Professor Feynman's approach, which recognizes uh, vulnerability as a constant characteristic that all humans share. But this approach would also create its own set of challenges. For the court, vulnerability needs to be something that is exceptional because it allows the court to do something exceptional in this, contest, in this context, and that is to require states to reallocate sources towards certain individuals, something which the convention in itself is not designed to do. So what is the potential uh, solution here? Now, one potential solution to this concern would be for the court to reconcile um, both approaches to vulnerability in its reasoning. So while relying primarily on the concept of vulnerable groups, the court's analysis could perhaps more deftly engage in a discussion on the circumstances of the individual applicant and how these would potentially trigger the state's duty to provide a minimum of welfare protection. So the fact that a person falls within a recognized vulnerable group could be viewed by the court as a very strong indicator of need, thus requiring the state to intervene, but it should not perhaps function as the sole indicator. So by further exploring the links between an applicant situation of poverty, vulnerability, and the state's duty to protect, the court could perhaps incrementally develop a more coherent and consistent test to determine the circumstances under which vulnerability would lead to a state duty to provide a social minimum of welfare. 
uh, this would, uh, of course, open up state responsibilities towards individuals who would not be considered members of a vulnerable group, at least uh, in the way in which the court has understood the concept thus far. But this approach would also secure socioeconomic privileges. Uh, sorry, this approach would also secure this, the, the socioeconomic privileges vulner, vulnerable groups currently enjoy and slowly build its jurisprudence in the direction of specifying a certain minimum of protection uh, that would be available to all those who need it, not just those who belong to a specific vulnerable group. So this is a very quick, uh, quick summary of the key points that I wanted to make uh, and sort of highlight the court's approach to vulnerability. And of course, I'd be enormously uh, happy to take any questions and feedback towards the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitrios. Uh, very interesting insight. The majority probably uh, comes more from a private law background, so therefore for us those uh, forays into, into the public law, into constitutional law and human rights, uh, uh, a useful reminder that there is other, uh, that there are other considerations out there. Um, you were also very good in sticking to your time, so without further ado, let's now move over to our uh, practitioner, Robin Feiner from the Financial Conduct Authority. Robin, please. Thank you. Um, no pressure to hit time then. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I'm going to try and uh, share my screen. Sorry, bear with me. Um, window. So I'm hoping that there should be some slides up. I, I can't see anything yes, other than my slides. You, we can see your slides. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks ever so much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I, I think it's re really interesting to hear the different sort of definitions and uses of vulnerability from the, the previous speakers. Um, so uh, move, it, it, it's going to be quite different from what Demetrius has, has just said, but 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 interesting to, to think about. Um, the equivalents. Um, so uh, just to, to give um, a brief introduction, uh, for those who don't know about the FCA, we're the conduct regulator for nearly 60,000 financial services firms and ensuring that all consumers have an appropriate degree of protection is central to what we do. Um, and that includes those who are vulnerable. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is talk a bit about um, how we understand consumer vulnerability at the FCA and what our role is in addressing it. And uh, at the end, I'll also just touch on how our understanding might change or evolve as, uh, as markets develop, particularly in, in the form of uh, technological changes. So uh, to start with, um, Let's, let's look at the definition that we give for vulnerability. Uh, we divide, define a vulnerable consumer as someone who, due to their personal circumstances, is especially susceptible to harm, particularly when a firm is not acting with appropriate levels of care. Now, in this context, as you might expect from a financial regulator, when we say harm, we're primarily talking about financial harm, but this can obviously lead on to emotional and psychological harm. And vulnerability can lead to consumers being both more likely to experience this harm through affecting their decision making and or more significantly affected by the harm as a result of their lower financial or emotional resilience. So um, by our definition, we're really all at risk of be becoming vulnerable and consumers can display a number of characteristics which make them more susceptible to being vulnerable at a, at a, um, at a given point in time. Um, and we can broadly group these into four drivers, um, health, life events, resilience and capability. These aren't uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, it's possible for a consumer to be vulnerable as a result of more than one driver at any one time. And it's uh, 
probably of no surprise to anyone that the pandemic has had a significant impact on uh, our definition of consumer vulnerability, uh, most likely as a result of, of all four uh, elements, all four drivers. And so you can see that um, in February 2020, the proportion of adults displaying a characteristic of vulnerability was 46%. And by October of the same year, that had increased to 53%, um, an increase of 3.7 million people. So um, consumers, uh, just, to, just to understand a, a bit more about um, how, the, how the vulnerability sort of traces through into, into harm. C consumers with uh, certain characteristics of vulnerability may be more likely to suffer from uh, certain behavioral patterns, such as a scarcity mindset. So this can reduce their bandwidth and uh, lead them to focus on certain factors of, of, the, of the product or service at the expense of others. And that may be more likely to, to lead them to make poor decisions about the purchase and or use of financial services. Their decision making may also be worsened by greater information asymmetry than otherwise exists. For example, English may not be a consumer's first language, or they may not be able to read as easily as others due to learning difficulties. This could make it harder for them to, to access or process relevant information in order to make an informed decision compared to, to, to consumers who don't display those characteristics. And again, that, that could lead to a greater risk of purchasing a product or service which doesn't really meet their needs or paying too much for it. And obviously, uh, firms' behaviour or their business decisions play a role here. If firms don't understand the impact of their actions in the presence of vulnerability and they don't respond to that, then vulnerable consumers will almost by definition, be at increased risk of experiencing harm. And even worse, there is a risk that firms exploit the poor decision making of those consumers, where that leads to increased profits for, for the firm. And it's not just that consumers might end up with poor value products. Uh, we also see examples of consumers with um, of vulnerable consumers being excluded from certain financial services. This might be because uh, so some of the characteristics of vulnerability lead them to, to have difficulty searching for products and services effectively. So, for example, the consumer may live in temporary accommodation and have unreliable access to the Internet. And without the right resources to search effectively, they may end up, may end up with, uh, with a more expensive or inappropriate product or even without access. Um, even further, firms may choose to not to serve consumers with certain characteristics of vulnerability as a result of the perceived risk that they represent. So we, uh, the Extra Costs Commission, for example, found that 3 million people with disabilities have been turned down for insurance or charged extra for, for that insurance. So what's our role in all of this at the FCA? Um, um, we don't live in a society where, uh, where consumers have an automatic right to receive all products and services. And uh, as it stands, uh, the provision by firms of most of these services is, is a purely commercial decision. So our role isn't to ensure universal access to all financial services. But our role is to ensure that the right conditions are in place so that consumers with characteristics of vulnerability experience outcomes as good as those for other consumers and that all consumers receive consistently fair treatment across the firms and sectors that we regulate. So that means intervening in markets where, where they're not working well for the consumers they serve and supervising and enforcing against firms that do not treat consumers in vulnerable circumstances in line with the rules and guidance we've developed to protect them. Now, 
unfortunately, we do still see firms taking advantage of consumer vulnerability. That's why in February 2021, earlier this year, we published guidance outlining our view on what firms should do to ensure the fair treatment of vulnerable consumers. We've also consulted on introducing a new consumer duty that would set higher expectations for the standard of care that firms provide to consumers, including those who are vulnerable. And the, the, this, the, uh, this, this duty should, should also help us to achieve the fair value outcomes for all consumers, which is one of our key priorities at the FCA. So we, we do think that our definition of vulnerability is somewhat future-proof. It, it accounts for personal circumstances and the duty of care provided by firms at a, at a pretty general level. And we think that these are concepts which can adapt as, as markets develop and our expectations for firms adjust. So we, we, we don't anticipate needing to change our definition. But we, we recognise that we operate in a world of rapid and disruptive change. The digitalisation of financial services means that the way consumers make decisions is, is ever evolving. And it's likely that the harms we see arising from consumer vulnerability and our understanding of vulnerability may well evolve too. Um, the digitalization of investing is a recent example as to how we are needing to, to pivot our understanding. We recently published research which found that a new, younger, more diverse group of consumers is getting involved in higher risk inv investments, potentially prompted in part by the accessibility offered by new, new apps. Um, Specifically, self-directed investors with less than three years experience are skewed towards the 18 to 24 age bracket and uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic demographics. Now, your age, gender and ethnicity doesn't automatically make you vulnerable, but it can mean that you're more likely to exhibit some of the characteristics of vulnerability that I mentioned earlier. Our research found that these investors may have the lowest levels of financial resilience. Nearly two thirds said that a significant investment loss would have a fundamental impact on their lifestyle compared to 38% of investment investors with more than three years experience. They also don't have appropriate knowledge about the risks of investing with four in 10 of them not viewing losing some money as one of the risks of investing. But digitalization is not just happening in the investment space. And that's why at the FCA, we're building out our digital market strategy. And as part of this, we will develop a framework to identify and assess potential harms and benefits arising from the increasing digitalization of financial services markets as well as a, a, a set of indicators and success, success measures. And we're, we're also very aware that these developments aren't unique to financial services. Every regulator will need to be alert to these changes. And we're working with Ofcom, the ICO and the CMA as part of the Digital Regulatory Cooperation Forum, collaborating on online regulatory matters of mutual importance. So there is perhaps scope to explore a broader cross-sectoral understanding of vulnerability to acknowledge the increasing interlinkages between different sectors. Um, and, 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 and what is the scope for, for further work? I mean, we, we could ask questions about whether a vulnerable consumer looks the same in every sector. Do the harms and the, the types of harm and the, the causes of harm to, to these consumers also look the same? And if not, what are the implications of this? Now, these, these are big questions to which I don't have the answer, um, but uh, I thought it might be in, uh, an interesting angle to add. I, I mean, I also think, um, thinking back to the, the earlier talks um, that we've heard in this session, um, the, the 
the stuff that Peter was talking about about loot boxes. Um, you, you can. I think that there's quite a lot of uh, read across to the to the thing I, I was I was talking about the example I was talking about about digital investments. So you can see some some parallels might be drawn there. And obviously um, we have a lot of interest in consumer credit. So um, very happy also to take questions and be involved in the discussion uh, that is about to follow. Thank you for your time. Sorry, Christopher, you're on mute. Very interesting presentations there. Thank you very much. I'll step in as Christopher is looking for the unmute button. Um, and I, I see already in the chat, we have a question from Martin. And it's interesting because that was the first thing I noted down. I, I saw a connection there and I'm doing exactly what I said in the introduction I, I shouldn't really be doing is trying to group people and find connections. But I think the connection here is, is great. So I'll start off with Martin's question about the role of uh, inclusive design. Martin, do you want to come on? Sure thing. Thanks ever so much. Um, very enjoyable. Um, we had a session um, previously and I did talk about inclusive design. Um, and it's really great that regulators are starting to, to point to inclusive design to firms to address vulnerability. So I know Robin in the FCA's consumer vulnerability guidance, it talks about um, consumer vulnerability for firms. Um, and um, I guess my question there is though, um, you talked about when it comes to consumer vulnerability, there are aspects where the market isn't delivering and there's real questions then about um, sh who should intervene in the market. So based on things like, can a, can a firm actually make money and can you force them to do something? Cross subsidization, all those tricky questions which often consumer organizations get battered between the treasury and the regulator, say improve market failure, you and your two members of your team, and then we might do something or go to the FCA, but then FCA, and I can understand why, would say it's a mixture of social regulatory policy, go back to the treasury. And I was just wondering um, if, if you think there's a role for inclusive design of policies for regulators and making sure the market is inclusive and um, rather than just saying to firms, you need to do inclusive design because th there is a, a limit to how far firms, firms will do that on their own. Thanks, Martin. Um, sorry, just trying to find the unmute button. Um, uh, I, it's, it's, a really, it's a really good question. Um, I, I think it's I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by inclusive oh, design if, 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 I, if i'm if i'm brutally honest in so far as i i, I think we, we 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 do compel firms to treat uh to treat vulnerable consumers at least equivalently fairly i think if we start talking about um i, I so, so let, let's take the example of uh, access to cash, uh, which is a big issue at the moment. And there I think it, it, it has necessitated government and regulators getting together to produce a policy that ensures that, um, that something that may not be in the uh, purely profit powered incentives of the firms uh, still exist. So there's a sort of public service obligation to mm. ensure that the market does deliver um, access to cash uh, across the, the country. And, and that has necessitated a joining up of, of government mm. and regulators. I don't think we could have done that uh, unilaterally. 
and so sometimes I, th I think that that hopefully answers your question that there are there are, there are some things which will need a a joining up of approach. Sorry, I should I should have just explain very briefly what I meant by that is um, so the FCA and other regulators are pointing to firms to use inclusive design to so to work with their customers to co-design products and services so they're inclusive from the get go. But um, many firms will only go so far, depending on the environment they're in. So it's just it's just around um, regulators now uh, working with, say, people in poverty or with disabilities to co-design the best policies and what they should prioritise, rather than perhaps thinking about, this is my institutional remit, these are my tools, and I'll use those tools no matter what, even if it doesn't quite fit the person. Thank you. I've, I've managed to get myself back in, so apologies for that earlier. Um, sticking with questions for Robin, I think, uh, Peter, you had one. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. Um, really, really interested in, in all the papers. It's been a fantastic experience listening to them. And this question really is one that I think draws together some of the themes. And it's from sort of a, a, a personal experience. But every year, um, I get a letter from a well-known provider of breakdown cover that tells me that my breakdown cover is going to cost me, let's say, £350 this year. And every year I have a conversation with them and we end up agreeing that I pay about half that amount. Now, it seems to me it cannot possibly be fair for that particular firm to behave in that way, particularly because it's not... It's all right for me because I know that that's not a realistic price that they're charging. I have the confidence to phone them up and have a firm and frank exchange of views with them. And I end up with a not unreasonable result. But I know perfectly well that lots of consumers are not in that position, either because they don't have the confidence to have those conversations or because they genuinely don't realize that the firm is trying it on with me. Isn't that the sort of conduct that the FSA should be challenging as being unfair to particularly to vulnerable consumers. Thank you, Peter. Before we let Robin answer that, um, Nick has to leave us in a few minutes. Therefore, are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Of no, no, it's fine. Like my, my wife has stepped into the breach and is picking up our son from the train station. So I'm okay, okay fantastic. Apology, sorry. Then, That's why the camera was off. <laughs> in that case, Robin, uh, I allow you to answer the question. Can't, can't Nick go? So I've got more time to think about my answer. No, uh, um, yeah. Um, so Peter, that 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 is actually the the subject of a of a very significant intervention that we've we've just made in in home and motor insurance. So we we did an investigation there into um, the renewal pricing. Of, of home and motor insurance. And we found significant evidence of a lot of harm being done to consumers in terms of uh, them paying uh, many multiples of the amount, up to many multiples of the amount they could have got if they'd uh, approached either as a new customer or, or, um, or um, alternative providers for their home and motor insurance and we have introduced new rules in those markets that um that 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 say that uh the insurer cannot charge a renewing customer any more than the equivalent new business price for the insurance product so and that, that those rules will come into force at the beginning of next year so that you will never be in that situation now that is a, a really significant intervention and uh we could only make it on the basis of having sort of very clear evidence of the harm and 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 uh done a lot of analysis to be confident that our intervention wouldn't have unintended consequences for other customers, especially those who are benefiting uh, from low new business prices. So, so it, is, it is an issue that we're, 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 we're very much aware of and we have intervened on. Thank you, Robin. Um... There is a question um, that was uh, indicated earlier in the chat. Andrew Beetham, you've got a question for, for Demetrius. Uh, 
Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating um, discussion on vulnerability in the European Court of Human Rights. Um, one thing I was wondering um, is whether or not, in respect of um, two things, really, is how far the court views um, uh, the, sort of the definition of a, a social group in terms of uh, stigma and uh, what is um, exclusionary. Um, and secondly, is in terms of a, a possible remedy, um, does the court just view uh, a, a possible remedy as a, a material one or a financial remedy or whether or not um, remedies can also go as far as uh, legal change? Excellent. Um, so I'll begin with the second part of your uh, question first. So as far as the remedies are concerned, uh, this could be anything. The court does have the power to, to provide damages as well. But usually it will, if, if, there is, if, I, if it identifies a structural problem in the respondent state, then the state would probably be required to take measures, probably legislative measures or policy measures to address that issue. Uh, the court, as you well know, doesn't have any strike down powers when it comes to domestic legislation, uh, but usually that's the, the, the remedy that it would provide. Now, um, I'm focusing on um, a specific type of uh, duty that may arise in these cases, and that is a duty of the state to provide material support to destitute individuals. So not a general duty uh, sort of to pay out victims of human rights violations that may occur in some cases, but a duty to provide a uh, sort of some sort of material assistance to individuals who find themselves in a position where they can't take care of themselves. Um, as far as the, 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 the stigma aspect of your question, so yes, the stigma is one of the rationales the court has relied on to assign vulnerable status to a group. So in uh, the examples I used of Roma people, the court told us that Roma people are vulnerable because they are stigmatized. And it followed the exact same approach when it came to individuals living with HIV. They're stigmatized, therefore, this is the reason why we think they're vulnerable. But as I mentioned, the court hasn't been consistent in when it comes to that. So prisoners are considered vulnerable for different reasons because they can't uh, provide for their own needs. They're wholly dependent on the state. That's why they're vulnerable. Asylum seekers are vulnerable for a different reason because they go through this perilous journey to reach safety. So there is a great degree of incoherence on why vulnerable status is assigned to a specific social group. Uh, and the court, by not providing a general definition of vulnerability, on the one hand, leaves itself some flexibility to decide which groups are vulnerable or not, but on the other hand, could be accused perhaps of being quite inconsistent um, as to how vulnerable status is assigned, which is problematic because, as I mentioned, vulnerable status has significant legal consequences. It is quite a legally meaningful term in the context of the court's case law. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Dimitriev. Are there any other questions on the floor? If not, then I might abuse my position as chair for, for, for this panel and ask a question of all of you before I then let all of us have our lunch, because without lunch, we turn vulnerable fairly soon, I think. Um, you've looked at the question of vulnerability all from very different perspectives. But I wonder whether one theme that, that joins all of your presentations is that vulnerability is really a, a, a at least two-step assessment, looking at certain characteristics, certain criteria of a person or group, and then some situational requirements. Um, and whether we should, whenever we talk about vulnerability, and maybe it's, it will be interesting to take that up with Martha uh, uh, Feynman also, um, ha have to bear in mind this strong situational aspect to, to, to any assessment. I don't know whether you just want to leave it as a statement or whether anybody would like to say more. Happy to say yeah. something, Christopher. Yeah. I, th I, think, I think the starting point is yes, is to say that I do I do agree with that. Um, Christine, um, very generously, uh, there's the introduction mentioned um, some of the work that I've done on um, vulnerability in financial services. 
And one of the things that I tried to do with that was to try to ask that question, what is it that makes some people particularly vulnerable? So we perceive vulnerability as sort of a relative concept. What makes people particularly susceptible to, um, to harm? And I th it seemed to me that there were, you know, some aspects that went to the individual and there were some aspects that went to the situation. So I sort of tried to, to just kind of formulate a, what we call, it, called the taxonomy of vulnerability that tried to address that. And it was things like, People are vulnerable because it's hard for them to get hold of or to use information. They're vulnerable because they're more susceptible to pressure than other people are. They're vulnerable because it's harder for them to get redress and so to put things right. They're vulnerable because it's harder for them to get access to products than other people are. But also, crucially, they're vulnerable because making the wrong decision has a greater impact upon them than it might do to other people consumers because you could be vulnerable to sort of physical harm for example because of a susceptibility or of course vulnerable to financial loss in the sense that if you make a bad choice um, and you're relatively poor that is a greater harm greater loss to you than it is to somebody who's wealthier now it's not it's not a perfect taxonomy or classification by any stretch of the imagination and I think over time I've realized what's some of the things that are wrong with it but it's trying to do what you're describing I think which is to get to the heart of what it is that makes some people more vulnerable than others in certain situations. Because I think if you can identify that, you can then hopefully find the right sorts of tools to be able to, to intervene and to, to address it. So those are, those are my sort of thoughts. Thank you, Peter. Nick, listening to, to your presentation, I was wondering whether um, you had come from a slightly different perspective by, by emphasizing more the, the fraudulent behavior on the side of the bank. So in, in a way, maybe, what, what we had just identified as the, as the situation requirements on the side of the vulnerable consumer might be outweighed by a particularly aggressive or careless fraudulent behavior on, on, on the firm side. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. I think what, I mean, it's not for me to bash the banks all the time, um, or, or lenders. I think that it's with with the book I wrote on the on the financial crisis, the the the, the evidence of predatory lending and, and the link into the subprime mortgage market and mortgage fraud was just um, unprecedented. I, I've not seen any sort of levels of, of deception from lenders over such a extensive period of time. And 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 I think it, it comes back down to the it's that sort of predatory instinct of some US lenders to 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 exploit um, you know vulnerable consumers, people who are financially excluded and have very low levels of income and very high credit um, ratings and, 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 and bills. And, and I think that it, it's just interesting that the, the American enforcement strategy has gone more down that particular route, which you would expect for, a, you know, we've seen in the last hour and a half, NatWest have admitted breaching the money laundering regulations today. And, and it, from reading the BBC report that the fine could be up to 400 million pounds. So, I just think it's interesting that the, the Americans have gone right. We have vulnerable consumers, absolutely, but we also have lenders who are exploiting their, their position, the importance of how important credit is in terms of getting a foothold onto the, the household ladder. So, yeah, I think it's fascinating and it'll be intriguing to see if we do end up with criminal convictions in uh, the States. So far, they've been financial penalties. Um, whether we'll get that within the UK, I, I'm not so sure. Um, I've not seen any sort of indications yet that any of the current prosecution service are going to prosecute anybody for irresponsible lending. I, I would be very surprised if that is the case. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I think we've reached a time to end our panel and to allow us to have our lunch. A couple of notices before that. First of all, thank you all very much to, to our speakers. It's been a very stimulating, interesting and insightful panel to um, everybody who, who contributed via questions. Um, a particular thank you also to Martin Kopak, who's put in the chat a link to, to their design guides um, uh, for both firms and regulators. Now to our host, uh, Tim, there is a question in the chat from Lucilla about, please let me know whether registration will be available. I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe you could help her or us out if that's something that we all have to do. We're, we're, we're working on that in the background. I think it's relating to recordings, so where, where the recordings will okay. be. And the recordings will be on the website as soon as they're available. They've been processed at the moment. Okay. Yes, you, of course. Thank you so much. Yes, Thank of you. course.
Uh, in that case, that's it for this morning. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you.